the first time, singer Peter Andre is speaking out about how coronavirus has ripped through his family. Yes, Peter and his wife, Dr Emily, who's an NHS doctor and could possibly receive her first vaccination dose today, were both affected by the virus and are still experiencing some side effects. They join us now. Very good morning to you both. It's lovely to see you both. And Dr Emily, we want to thank you, obviously, for your service to the NHS during this difficult time. Hope you do get your vaccine today. Peter, tell us about how your family has been affected by COVID, because we are seeing in what feels like more people who are younger um, suffering quite negative effects from COVID. I know you were you were laid low with it, weren't you? Yeah, so, um, I mean, it's, it's quite unbelievable because everyone has different symptoms. And I think one of the key things I wanted to say was don't ignore your symptoms because they're not all going to be the same. Um, to the point that when I had symptoms, I was absolutely convinced that um, I didn't have the virus and even you were convinced, right? That, that... Yeah, I think it just wasn't textbook how it presented in you. And it was a lesson for, for, for both of us, wasn't it, really, to just, you know, be vigilant of your symptoms. So what yeah. were your symptoms, Peter? I didn't have, I didn't have um, a temperature. Um, I had body aches. I had a cough. I mean, it wasn't as persistent as what I'd been told, but it was persistent enough that we thought we should go and get a check. But the key thing about that was that once I went and got the test, we self-isolated for 10 days. So we knew once we got the positive result that in that 10 days, we could not infect anyone else. So that was a that was massive for us. And it just goes to show that had we not gone and got tested. Yeah. And yeah, I, there was a couple of days. It was very unpleasant. But people have had it far worse than me. Um, one of my cousins is still on oxygen now. He, and he was sick before me. Um, and it just goes to show that everyone's got uh, different symptoms. You can't ignore it. You can't. Emily, you're due to have your first uh, vaccine dose today, I think. Is that right? Well, hopefully this week. I mean, we sort of, you know, I just sort of wait until I hear um, when it will be. and I'm kind of on standby um, and looking forward to it. Even though, you, you know, you're a health worker and you've had the virus, but we know that it can come back. We know that a lot of health workers have been reinfected because of the constant exposure to the viral load from coronavirus. Um, does that worry you? And does it worry you that you may only get the first dose and have to wait 12 weeks for the second? There is an argument that health workers in particular should be getting the second dose very quickly, within three weeks, so you're properly protected. I mean, for me, I don't feel worried. Obviously, I'm in a position where I am relatively young and I'm healthy. So from my perspective, you know, I was very happy to let more vulnerable people come forward um, and get the vaccine first. Obviously, I am being offered it as part of my job role and, you know, I, I will take it and that's great. I'm very grateful for that. Um, in terms of the second dose, I think, you know, I, I again, I do feel happy if, if, if I end up getting just one dose. The research is showing that even if the second dose is given after 21 days with either either the Pfizer or the AstraZeneca um, vaccine, you do still get a good level of protection. Um, so, I, you know, I feel happy, happy with that. I think it's about getting a degree of protection to as many people as possible, yeah. if that means it's a little bit longer. Peter, you mentioned that your cousin is still in hospital. What? Tell us a little bit about your cousin and, and, and why they're so badly affected. Well, this is this is exactly what... When I got told that he was sick, um, both my cousin and his son, um, they were both sick and they were both in hospital and both on oxygen, and his son is younger than me, I... All of a sudden, I realised psychologically what this is doing to a lot of people. We're so scared about what is going to happen. You know, what symptoms are you going to have? And when we, when I heard that they were in a bad way, and my cousin still is in hospital now, it really brought it home how serious this is and how, um, you know, I get people. I kid you not. I had somebody yesterday send me a message saying. I can't believe that you're being a puppet for the media trying to tell people that this virus is real. Um, and they said, you disgust me. I had somebody say that yesterday. You disgust me. We never saw your your um, thing from the NHS saying you were positive. Because obviously, what am I going to do? Just put it up on screen. It's, it's a and ridiculous... You know what, Peter, and, I, and, and maybe this is one for Emily, but I was watching the evening news last night, BBC, ITN, Channel 4. All of them had correspondence in the wards 
talking to people. It was one uh, harrowing interview with a man on BBC News. And it was Clive, uh, Clive Myrie, Myrie, isn't it, who did it? Yeah. And he'd literally just lost his wife. And uh, he was talking about uh, the agony of that. But when you saw them talking, all the health workers, uh, all saying it's the worst they've known, far worse than the first wave of this. What does it take, Emily, to get people to comprehend how serious this is? I think sometimes you can't persuade some people. I think if they're so fixed in believing that this is a big conspiracy, you know, how many horror stories do we need to hear? How many frontline workers do we need to hear from? I think sometimes you can't convince everyone, but I think all we can do as individuals is keep sticking to the rules, you know, having empathy for everyone around us, trying to all stick together. Um, and if you're eligible, get the vaccine. That's the most important message I think we mm -hmm. have at the moment, that the only light we can see, the only way out of this at the moment is the vaccine. Um, so I would just say to anyone who's eligible, please consider getting it. It's so important. Peter, you yeah. have um, family, don't you, in Australia? I know you'd been in touch with the embassy about, um, you know, the possibility uh, to go. Just tell us, what, tell us, because obviously we're all separated from parents, from grandparents, from loved ones. You know, we, but we have over here, if our parents are here, we have limited opportunities to go and see them. There is still, thank goodness, that opportunity to take exercise one plus one if, you, if you're able to do that locally. But when you've got family so far away, you must feel very... Uh, disconnected from that. What is the situation in Australia and the possibility to travel to see loved ones there or for them to leave Australia? Yeah, so I rang the embassy because I looked online and I saw that they had certain guidelines and you have to meet certain criteria. But I thought, I'm a bit old school and I want to get on the phone and just ask a couple of questions. And I said, you know, I asked what you had to do. And apparently you have to be an Australian citizen, which I'm not, um, which I regret now so much that I'm not an Aussie citizen. And at the time I could have got my citizenship. I was in England and things were, you know, moving well. And I was like, yeah, I'll go back and do it. And I didn't. Um, and that's kind of come back to bite me because now I can't go and see mum and dad. Now, I, I want to make it clear. I know that there are people that live here in the UK that have a mother or a father two miles away and they might not be able to see them for whatever reason. So I totally understand I'm in no... Um, greater position to, 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 you know, I'm no one special to go and uh, go and see mum and dad. But obviously, thank God for things like FaceTime, which my mum still can't use, and she, I can still only see the top of her head. Uh, you know, how do I want you to feel? How do you feel, Pete? Uh, there's this raging row going on in Australia about the Australian Tennis Open tournament, where they've flown in several hundred tennis players who are now all bleating, led by Djokovic, about the conditions they're having to quarantine in. But how do you feel that you're not allowed to go and see your parents, but all the tennis players are coming in and complaining, but are going to be there just to play tennis? I mean, it's all relative, isn't it, to what you do and, and what your situation is. Uh, I can't sort of speak on their behalf, you know, because they probably haven't got a parent that's 12,000 miles away and they wouldn't understand. Um, so I can't, it's not really for me to say. I think, you know, when you go, I know if I did go to Australia and I had to do two weeks, I'd be absolutely fine with that just to be able to see mum and dad. But they're not in that position. I can't. What do you think? I mean, you're, you're, you're I, the best. Well, I think it's very interesting that the, the people in Australia and the media have been very critical of the tennis stars who've been complaining. You know, they, want, they want better conditions, they want to have villas with they want tennis to courts and so on. And I get that if they're in a hotel room for two weeks, it's not the best preparation for a tennis tournament. But you're a performer, for example. You can't do concerts at the moment. Um, so it does seem like there's one rule for some of the sporting world, another rule for the entertainment and arts world. You know, I don't know what the honest answer is to this, but I do know it seems there'll be lots of people, I think, looking at you, your situation and thinking, there's a guy who hasn't seen his mum and dad for a year, desperate to see them, mm. uh, and yet you've got... And tennis, you can't go because tennis you're players not an Australian have, citizen. Tennis players who have been allowed in, all they're doing is complaining yeah. about the quality of the food and the, and the living accommodation. It just seems like they've got their priorities wrong. Anyway, uh, listen, uh, Emily, best of luck to you. Yes. Uh, keep doing your great work. Uh, we value every single one of you at the moment in the NHS. It's heroic work you're all doing in incredibly difficult circumstances. So, thank you. And, Pete, great to see you, as always. Yeah, Pete, just, to, just before we let you go, do, are you still experiencing some of the fallout from the COVID? 
so the only things I've noticed, I've still got no sense of smell. Um, and I went for a small bike ride yesterday and I was completely puffed out. And I said to Emily, that never happens to me. So there's clearly, you know, I guess if you had any sort of virus, you, you've got to be a bit careful. But it's the psychological thing. It's, you know, is it going to get worse at some point? Do you, am I going to this, am I going to that? This is what the problem is. With I the, think that with... is the biggest thing which people underestimate. You know, when my parents had it quite quite badly, didn't get hospitalised, fortunately, but you know, it was the psychological pressure as the days mm. go by of when you reach worse? that eight, nine, mm. ten day stage, am I going to be one of the ones that goes suddenly downhill very fast? And I think we yeah. shouldn't, shouldn't underestimate that. I think it's a really yeah. big problem. And, Peter, what you're people. referring to is that psychological sort of shadow of am I going to be someone who has long-term mm. sort of fallout from, you know, the well, long COVID that people mm. talk about? I mean, this is the thing. Um, I'm 47, I exercise, yeah. I feel quite good, and yet I had a doctor in the house and still there were nights where I woke up saying, OK, some people are going to say, you know, grow up. I get that. But you can't help what's happening in your mind. And I'm thinking I'm finding it hard to breathe. And she's like, calm down. It's a lot of it's anxiety. And and I, I thought, did you see it on the media played out so much? You, you, you know, yeah, you, you do hear the stories of the young people who are getting really unwell. And I think it just makes you worry more than you would do if you didn't know that it was COVID. But imagine an, an elderly person living on their own or someone vulnerable. Yeah, we said that a lot. Imagine how yeah. they're feeling. You know, it's, it's, it's very it's, tough. I mean, because the media, I think, have a duty to tell people how serious this is so that people take it seriously. Yeah. But at the same time, you don't want to over-scare people because it is a very worrying thing when you get it, you know, for obvious reasons. People know how deadly... Our lives would not be in this ridiculous state of, of lockdown hell with the worst death rate in the world in this country if it wasn't a serious situation. But, look, guys, uh, great to see you both. Keep Glad getting you came better. And all the best Thanks. to you.